to this PIR live event brought to you by Partners in Research, Beaker Head, and the Alberta Women's Science Network. A special thank you to Cisco for providing us with a home base for Commander Harrington to connect from today. My name is Stacey Joyce, and I am the VROC Program Manager at Partners in Research, and I will be your host for today. It is my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest, Commander John Harrington. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Stacey. It's my pleasure to be here, and thanks so much for everybody to uh, tune into this. This is great. So let's, uh, let's talk about who that everybody is. We have two classes joining us in today's video conference. So if you're watching the stream, you can see them as well. We have uh, the grade nine students at Kainai High School in Cardston, Alberta. Can you give us a wave there? There they are. And we have Mr. Ginter's grade five, six class at Ridpath Junior Public School in Lakefield, Ontario. I see those waves. All right. We've also got almost 200 classes from across Canada and the USA who are joining us today via live webcast. Welcome, everyone. So just a couple housekeeping items before we begin. I will interject periodically to invite each of our video conference classes to ask Commander Harrington a question or to ask a question from Twitter on behalf of our webcast viewers. If you have a question for the commander, you can post it on Twitter with the hashtag AskHarrington, and that's two R's in Harrington. If you have space, include your name and your school name and or city so that we can give you a shout out for where the question came from. We are monitoring this throughout the event and we may ask your questions, so make sure you post it there. So to kick things off today, Commander Harrington, Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about yourself and answer a question we received from Ms. Tammy's grade five, six class in Calgary and the Burnham grade sixes in Cobert, Ontario. Why did you want to become an astronaut and how did you go about doing that? Why? That's a great question. Well, thank you for that one. And it's really a pleasure for me to be here. And thanks to Cisco for allowing us to happen as well in Beakerhead. This is a great, uh, great opportunity to be back in Calgary. So um, why did I want to be an astronaut? Well, when I was about eight years old, I used to sit in a cardboard box and dream I was going to the moon because in the 1960s, that's what we were doing. What, when I was growing up, the space program was on TV and the reality of actually doing something exciting like that uh, sparked the imagination of, of you know, hundreds of thousands of people across the country. And uh, I was one of those. But at eight years old, it was a, it was a dream, but I didn't really think it would become reality because I thought that's what other people did and that I was just this little kid living in Colorado at the time uh, that had a dream, played astronaut, but I never really pursued it as a career until much later. Um, I was very fortunate that um, by the time I, I had joined the Navy because I had people that encouraged me to join the Navy. I went to college because people encouraged me to go to college. Um, when I was a test pilot in the Navy, I realized that all these things, that I, the things that I dreamed about as a kid I was now in a school where there were people that I watched on TV back in the 60s that actually had gone to the, were going to the moon, uh, had flown on Mercury, Gemini, or Apollo. I was in a school where those same individuals, half of them, had actually gone to that exact same school. And I realized that the reality of becoming an astronaut, uh, it was not a dream anymore, uh, but was, I was much closer to reality. So I, uh, I knew I needed a master's degree. <clears throat> I needed an advanced <clears throat> degree to uh, pursue that. And I applied after earning a master's of science in uh, aeronautical engineering. I applied uh, twice to NASA, and they called me down on the second application, and uh, they interviewed me. And I still didn't think I'd get selected because I, I thought other people uh, would be selected. And I was fortunate to be one of those they did. And that was uh, how I came down that path. But there's a lot of other little changes in that, uh, that path that were not necessarily straight uh, in, in that direction, and I'll be talking about those in a little bit uh, a little bit later. I bet. So you applied twice then. I don't know that that would be something people would normally think of, that you, <laughs> you could apply more than once. I had a friend that applied, I think he applied ten times, and he interviewed five times. And he was selected in my class, and he's flown on space station twice, and he's a brilliant guy. His name's Don Pettit. And uh, there's persistence. I mean, I was fortunate in the two applications that I did and one of those to be actually interviewed. 
And that's when you get to tell the story about well, where you came from, because that's the interview question. The interview question is, uh, the interview question they ask you is, tell us everything you've done since you're in high school. And then you have 45 minutes to tell the story. And during that 45 minutes, they will stop you and they'll ask you questions about the things you talk about. And then at the end of that, you're allowed to ask them a question or two, and then you're done. So it's a pretty interesting interview process. Wow. Crazy competitive, too. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's get started with our questions. We had a lot of questions come in even before our event, and they're still coming in now. <clears throat> so Miss McKenzie's grade fives and sixes from BWE's Family School in Alberta want to know, what First Nations band are you? Okay, that's a great question. I belong to a tribe in Oklahoma uh, called the Chickasaw Nation. Uh, my tribe is in south central Oklahoma, but that's not our original home. Our original homelands were uh, in the southeastern, what were one, where were once the, uh, the southeastern United States. Um, we were displaced by the U.S. government in about 1835 uh, to what they called Indian Territory, uh, along with a variety of other tribes in the southeastern United States. Uh, that was uh, called the Indian Removal Act, and that was a uh, time when um, I think it was Andrew Jackson who graces our $20 bill, and I don't know why. Uh, he uh, actually moved all these tribes to uh, Indian Territory, and my tribe was one of those. Uh, we were fortunate in this journey, once we got to Oklahoma, that we had an agreement with another tribe, uh, the Choctaw Nation, who we had at one time actually been the same, they believed to be the same band, um, we had a treaty with them that ceded about half of their lands to us uh, in central Oklahoma, what became central Oklahoma, what happened to now be um, a, a trade route from Texas to Kansas for cattle, became a railroad route from Texas to Kansas for cattle, and then it became I-35, uh, Interstate 35, which ran up to uh, Kent, you know, the rest of the United States. And so our tribe is a very remarkable spot in terms of economic commerce. Uh, my tribe has done very well. And I've been very, uh, very honored uh, to be a member of the tribe. Excellent. So our next question comes from Ms. Brands Grace Reeds in Calgary. And they want to know, what was your biggest surprise when you first arrived in space? Oh, boy. That was my, my biggest surprise when I first got to space. Um, the, uh, I sat on the flight deck of the space shuttle, so if you can imagine, the commander would sit uh, on the left side, the pilot would sit on the right side, and I sat right between, just behind those two, and my job was to work as a, a flight engineer and help them manage the systems uh, of the space shuttle. And the first thing we got to space, it wasn't, it wasn't looking out the window, the first thing I did when the engines quit, and the engines, um, you have three main engines uh, that burn for about, well, burn for eight and a half minutes, uh, the last minute of that ascent to orbit, uh, you're pulling about three times your normal body weight. So if you can imagine um, laying on your back and having somebody sit on you, uh, essentially. Uh, I weighed, uh, say I weigh 150 pounds, I weighed three times that, 450 pounds. And when the engines quit, you go from weighing <clears throat> exactly three times your body weight to zero instantaneously. And so the first thing I did was um, whatever I felt was sitting on my chest, it felt like it jumped off. And I went, ah, breathing, it was hard to breathe. And then I let go of my, uh, my checklist. I had a, if you can imagine, I had a checklist in my, my hand. That's not it, but I picked it up and I let it go. And it would sit there and float right in front of my face. And to me, it wasn't looking out the window. It was watching something that my entire life would have done that sat there and hovered in front of my face. And I would just, it was just so cool to watch that. And I think this is, Oh, wow, I'm actually in space. This is really neat. And that was the one OG whiz moment that really caught my attention when I first got there. And then I looked out the window. Amazing. All right. Our next question. <clears throat> we did have Mr. Banks' grade 3 class in Calgary, which wanted to know how long it took to go from ground to space. So you mentioned that that was, you know, around eight and a half minutes or so, maybe a little longer. But they also wanted to know, do you just go straight up? And Franklin from Toronto wants to know uh, what that feels like. So you mentioned the idea of, uh, you know, three times your weight and then nothing and what that did with the checklist. But how did you feel when the engines quit? Uh, and did you go straight up to get there? 
That's a great question. Let me, we have a whiteboard here, so we're going to have some fun. Um, <clears throat> if we went, <clears throat> let's see if I can do this, get this right here. Um, I'm a terrible artist, but we'll, we'll try at it. This is the Earth, and if we launched straight up, say, uh, we launched straight up off the Earth like this, I don't know if you can see that. That one's not working. Let's see. Get one here that works. All righty, here we go. If we launch straight up, what happens? Gravity is going to pull us straight back down. So we'd fall back to the surface of the Earth. What we do on the space shuttle, a little different. If you can imagine, you got your Earth. We launch and go around the Earth. So what happens as gravity pulls you back, you're going so fast, as gravity pulls you back to Earth, the Earth falls away from you. So you're in this constant free fall around the Earth. Now, gravity hasn't gone anywhere. Gravity is still doing its thing. It's trying to pull you back to the Earth. But since you're going so fast, and that's about 17,500 miles an hour, 28,000 kilometers per hour is about how fast you're going. You're doing about 7.88 kilometers per, uh, per second in the space shuttle. That speed is, is such that as gravity pulls you back, the Earth falls away from you. See, in this constant free fall, you feel like you're weightless. You feel you're floating because everything else around you is floating. And you don't realize that, you know, gravity's still there, but you're not experiencing it because you're in this constant free fall. If you've ever been on a trampoline or you ever jumped off of a, uh, a diving board, in that moment as you're floating down to the water or back down to the trampoline, if everything else was falling with you, you would feel weightless. You would actually think you were weightless because you essentially are until you, you hit the ground. And we, luckily, we don't do that. We just go really fast around the Earth. And it takes eight and a half minutes to go from zero uh, to 28,000 kilometers per hour uh, in the space shuttle. Zip. And it happens pretty darn quick. Wow. Is that good? Is that? That's my art? Okay. I, I like the art. It, it, yeah. Made an impression <laughs> on me. Um, so let's, uh, let's go to our classes that are participating directly now. So uh, it's just going to take us one second to turn your volume back on there. But we'll go to Kainai High School. And I think we've got someone there with a question. And see, even astronauts do a little cleaning now and then, everyone. Oh, all the time. <laughs> How does a landing happen and how does it feel? That's a great question. And I just erased my earth. Okay, we'll try it again. Here we go. <laughs> and the space, I said, the only reason we're staying in orbit is we're going really, really fast. And so you're doing this, you're going really fast around the earth. Well, if you want to come home, you actually turn the space shuttle around and you fire two engines on the back of the space shuttle. And what that does, it causes you, it causes the space shuttle to actually slow down. And as you slow down, what happens, gravity now overcomes your ability to go around the Earth, and you start falling back to the surface. They, they burn the engines, or we burn the engines, about 45 minutes. Correct me. It takes 90 minutes to go around the Earth. So if you can imagine, on the opposite side of the Earth, we turn around and burn our engines so that we slow down, so that as we fall back to our landing site, we fall back in the atmosphere, and we glide to a landing because the space shuttle, after you fire those two engines, you don't fire any more engines except to control the attitude of the shuttle. And it takes about 45 minutes to come home. So you come back as a big glided rock, essentially, uh, back to the Kennedy Space Center. Or uh, if the weather's bad, you go to the Edwards Air Force Base in California. Or if the weather's bad, you go to uh, White Sands, New Mexico. And that's only happened once. So it's a... Uh, you come home by slowing down and gliding back to a landing. How did it feel? Um, I've, I've never felt so heavy in my entire life. I felt that um, being weightless for two weeks uh, was a fabulous experience. But when we first started coming back into the atmosphere, I would take my checklist that was floating before, and as I, I would let it go, it would slowly start to sink. And so as you come back in the atmosphere and slow down or decelerate, my book would start to fall down, and so it was no longer floating. Um, the same thing happens. You feel heavy. You feel, I felt terrible. I felt like somebody had dropped a, uh, a large sack of potatoes on my head because uh, I couldn't, uh, it was hard to stand up. 
Uh, I was nauseous. Um, I was thrown up. Um, I did not like being back in uh, in a 1G environment. Um, my, I, had, I had a job to do. I actually had to uh, look up and, and move some switches on, on top of the, uh, the space shuttles, uh, the flight deck, and had to turn around and do some switches back here. If you've ever been on a roller coaster or been on an airplane and done a lot of this and uh, get really dizzy, you turn your head and it gets, um, it's not pretty. And it took about a week to actually feel like I was back on the earth. I, uh, um, I, would, I would walk around corners and bump into walls. <clears throat> I would take off my hat and I would throw it and I'd miss the table. Um, I'd lay in bed at night and I'd swear that was the floor because it was uh, in space. And it took about a week for that, those sensations to go away. And that was, uh, that was an interesting week. It was a lot of fun. It's a great question. Excellent. And next, we're going to go to Ridpath Junior Public School for a question. So who at Ridpath Junior Public School has a question for us? Feel free to tell us your name before you ask your question if you want. OK, a bunch of you have questions. Who'd like to ask the question right now? OK, uh, Jake, let's start with you. Did you ever go out of your space shuttle? Did I ever go out of my space shuttle? Um, yes, I did actually. I, I did three spacewalks. Um, when I, uh, the space shuttle we flew on I actually docked to the International Space Station. And my job, along with another gentleman on the space shuttle, was to do three spacewalks. And we actually did our spacewalks not from the space shuttle, we did our spacewalks from the space station. And so myself and a guy named Mike uh, Lopez Alegria, uh, we went out three different times and helped assemble a large uh, piece of uh, uh, metal on the outside of the space station. And the space station is huge. It's about the size of a uh, football field, uh, soccer pitch, essentially. Uh, it's pretty big. And our job was to install a large uh, truss assembly. And truss assembly, I mean, kind of like, like a bridge, big iron piece of steel that held uh, these large panels that helped cool the space station. Because all electronics inside space station generate heat, you actually have to get rid of that heat. And you can't, you can't roll down the window uh, to cool things off. What happens is it takes all that heat and it transfers that heat to a bunch of water. And that water is transfers all of its heat to stuff called ammonia. And ammonia is the same stuff you use at home to clean, um, clean cabinets or clean your countertops. And that, that ammonia takes all that heat out to the very end of the piece we installed and lets it sit there and that heat gets radiated to space. And so that helps keep the space station cool. So I had a chance to do three spacewalks and uh, leave the shuttle in the space station. And that was absolutely the high point of my being in space. That was pretty neat. Excellent question. Great. And so um, I'm going to go to one of the, the funnier questions that you, you might not think of it, but uh, we had at least five or ten different people ask, how do you go to the bathroom on an EVA and while you're in the shuttle or the space station? How does that work in space? Yeah, I, I've never heard that question before. No, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a good, it's, a, it's a good question. The reason it's a good question is because we're human and we go to these environments and we have to learn how to deal with being human. And so uh, two different ways. Uh, going to the bathroom on the space shuttle is you have a toilet. You have a, a toilet a little different than the toilet you have at home. If you can imagine the toilet you have at home, the gravity is your friend in the bathroom, right? Okay, so luckily gravity helps us do our business on the Earth. In space, in the space shuttle, you don't have that gravity component to help you do your business. And so what you have to do is two things. One, you uh, use vacuum to actually pull the urine away uh, when, you have, when you urinate. Uh, when you have to uh, go number two, um, you have to uh, use a toilet that actually creates a vacuum. And you sit on this little cushy seat, and you have to sit on it and get comfortable. And when you're ready to go, and unfortunately, the people in Houston uh, that are watching this know you're, they're not watching you, but they know when you turn the switch on. Uh, you create a vacuum. You turn the switch on, you pull a handle up, move the lever forward, and it opens a little door. You can imagine where that door's at. Uh, opens a little door, and it creates this vacuum. And that vacuum pulls the waste away from you. But it's not like a a big vacuum cleaner that's going, it's not like that. It's a, very, it's a very gentle thing. So you have to be very careful because 
One of the hardest things to do in space is to go to the bathroom. Been there, done that, know what that's like. Uh, the other one is uh, on the uh, spacewalk. When you do a spacewalk, you actually wear a diaper. Now, we've heard stories about diapers and astronauts, but we won't go there. Um, the, um, the diaper is there if, if you want to use it. And I can go outside for eight and a half hours and not use the bathroom. So uh, we were spacewalked for about seven hours, about nine hours from start to finish. So <clears throat> you, uh, put your, uh, you put your diaper on, you put the rest of your suit on, and you go out and, and you work really hard. The thing is, you only have about 32 ounces of water. You have a little bag of water to drink uh, inside the suit. You don't have anything to eat. So you spend you know, pretty much your entire work day uh, in a suit, and your bathroom is right there with you. But I didn't use it. So, But that's the way you would do it in a space suit. Good question. I just have this vision of you rushing back into the space station saying, I got to go. <laughs> uh, some things don't change, I guess, depending on where you are. Yeah, so that's true. Let's to a question we received on Twitter from a grade five, six class at Colonel Walker School. They want to know if there's a height restriction for being an astronaut. Could you have an astronaut that is six foot eight? No. <laughs> there is a height restriction, yes. Um, and the height restriction is based on how do you fit in the vehicle. That's what it's based on. Also, it's based on some of the suits. The suits are only certain sizes. Uh, I think the, the height allowable maximum height was 6'4 uh, on the space shuttle. My commander was 6'4, and that's based on you know uh, the rudder pedals on the space shuttle. If you're going to actually fly the space shuttle as a pilot, um, you know there's a certain length of uh, allowable that your knees start getting crunched up and, and you're not, you won't fit. I think 6'4 was for the, uh, the height requirement for, for uh, tall. For short, um, I think it was right around a little, less than, a little above 5 feet maybe around five feet, because we've had some astronauts, uh, some of the females were, uh, were pretty short. Um, the problem there is that when you go to get in the suit to do a spacewalk, uh, we didn't have suits that were that small. And that was one of the challenges. You know, a lot of them are very capable, with some very capable spacewalkers that are female, um, they would have fit in a certain size suit. So the smaller the person, they would not spend the money to build a suit when only one or two people in the office were, uh, were that size. And so that was one of the challenges. And um, we had, um, I'm about 5'9", five 5'8", five five or so, so it, I fit uh, essentially the right size. Uh, one of the requirements now is you have to fit in the Russian spacecraft, uh, the Soyuz. And I'll tell you, the Soyuz is a lot smaller than the space shuttle. And you get the Soy if you can imagine, uh, I like Volkswagens, if you can imagine putting three uh, very close friends in the front seats of a Volkswagen, you can kind of get an idea of really how tight the space is inside the Soyuz. And you're laying on your back, and your knees are up against your chest, and you ride that way for, uh, on the launch and then on, on into the space station. So it's a tight fit. Those requirements are actually different, and, and they're more stringent than on the space shuttle. And so now you actually have to fit in the Soyuz spacecraft to be selected as a NASA astronaut, uh, a U.S. astronaut you're limited by what the requirements are for a Russian spacecraft. And maybe that'll change when we have our uh, U.S. goes back to having their own vehicle. Excellent question. Yeah. Uh, Griffin in Ms. Clark's class and Josiah at Rawlinson in Toronto want to know, what do you do in space once you're there? Uh, that's another, you guys, everybody has great questions. Um, what do you do in space? Well, um, you work. You work incredibly hard. One of the things you've, what you've done in your career as an astronaut is the government, in my case, the U.S. government, paid millions of dollars for me to be able to go to space. And they didn't pay millions of dollars for me to go to space to go to the window and go, and just look out the window. You know, I had a job to do. And so the investment of the U.S. government in me was to make me capable to go up and do my job in a very short period of time and to do it well and not make mistakes and not uh, cause problems. So what I did in space is I worked. Uh, I worked going uphill on the space shuttle as a flight engineer. Uh, I was in uh, one of the responsible people for uh, monitoring systems and if something went bad uh, to work through all the emergencies. And fortunately, not, uh, nothing really serious happened on our flight. Once I got to orbit, um, my primary responsibility was to spacewalk and to be a uh, I call it a high-altitude high iron worker. And uh, when, I, when I was first interviewed to be an astronaut, 
one of the questions I was asked at the very end of that, the question about tell us everything you've done since you were in high school, uh, the very last thing that one of the astronauts asked me was why should I, why should you hire me? You know, what do I have that other folks don't have? And, and the reality of it was I had, you know, I had a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. I had a bachelor's in applied mathematics. I was a test pilot. I flew airplanes. Ew, pretty much a lot of the people in there had done the same thing and in, in the people that I was competing with. Uh, what I said was I like to build stuff. Uh, I like to tinker. I, you know, I build decks. I work on cars. I know how to, I know how to fix things mechanically. Uh, I like working with my hands. I like being hands-on. And I said, you know, I, I think the space station is the ultimate construction program. And I would love to turn a wrench in space. And they said, okay, thank you. And I walked out thinking it was the dumbest answer I could ever have given to a question. I was embarrassed. Because uh, it was so, it kind of, to me, sounded a little bit silly. But in the reality of it was, what did I do in space? I've got pictures of me turning a wrench. Uh, I used power tools. I knew how to work with my hands and do things that I was required to do as an astronaut, not because I was an aerospace engineer, not because I was an applied mathematician, but because I knew how to work with my hands. I knew how to tinker with stuff. I knew how to fix things when things didn't work right. Uh, I had that practical, that mechanical ability that is not really talked about and was not, let's say, known to be a requirement to be an astronaut, but I, it sure worked out. And that's exactly, uh, I was fortunate that that was the right answer. The right answers always seem to feel like the wrong ones sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Well, so you work incredibly hard. You do EVAs. You monitor the systems. You fix mechanical parts when they need fixing. But Buchanan Park Elementary in Hamilton, Ontario, wants to know, do you have TV or music on the space station? <laughs> uh, we didn't have TV. We did have music. I took a little uh, a CD player, actually. As a matter of fact, uh, I think now they use, um, um, they use electronics, maybe iPods or whatnot. Um, I used a, a little CD player. As a matter of fact, I had a chance to take along CDs from different artists that I admired and I liked their work. And so what I did is I would listen to C uh, the CDs at night. When I go to sleep, I'd actually put a headset on and I'd Velcro my head to the pillow because you have a pillow, but you're not laying on it because gravity's not pulling you down. So actually Velcro your head to the pillow. And I wore a headset because there's a lot of noise in the space station and the space shuttle. And so I would listen to music. And, um, for example, uh, I took 2001 A Space Odyssey, the theme music from 2001 A Space Odyssey. And it was different. I mean, I remember watching the movie, and it was a lot of fun. And it had this, I'm really here. That was cool. Um, I also took music from some indigenous. Uh, I'm actually a group called Indigenous. I took their music. I took some a guy named Jack Gladstone, who's Blackfoot. I took his music. Um, and I took that CD that I played in my CD player, and I floated it over the window with the earth in the background. I took a picture of it, and I sent it back to the artist uh, after I came back. So that was pretty cool. They, they got a kick out of that. So uh, the music that you like, you get to take. Good. So you, you do get to do some, some relaxing things, but it sounds like only while you're sleeping. Pretty much you have about – you work for uh, – you have a 16-hour day, and you're given eight hours of, of your time uh, in the 24 hours to actually sleep. Uh, I never slept eight hours. I slept maybe six at the most. Sometimes I slept about three. Uh, the very first night, I couldn't sleep very well uh, because imagine for the very first time in your life, you're not laying down. You're not touching anything. And so to try and go to sleep when you're sitting there going, You know, you can't, it's weird. It's a strange feeling. So what I would do is I would squeeze myself between bags on the space shuttle and, and push myself up against the wall and, and try and sleep like that because you want that feeling of something uh, pressing up against you. You've done it your entire life. So um, to get really restful, long, long-term sleep, it takes a little bit getting used to that. Uh, but you can take a nap real easy. You can take a nap and just float around the cockpit of the space shuttle. That was fun. So I sleep here. Wake up over here. That's cool. A lot of fun. Strange. Ooh. Interesting. <clears throat> so let's um let's go back to our direct participants on the video conference. So we'll go back to Ridpath Junior Public School. 
for another question from Mr. Ginter's class. Do we have, can you, can you hear us at uh, RIPA? Yes. Can you hear us? Okay. 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 I can hear you now. Please, please go ahead. Do you have a question? Okay. I have, um, it's pull it up here, so just give me a sec. Um, what is the weirdest thing, thing you encountered in space? <laughs> What, what was the, the weirdest thing I encountered in space? Um, let's see. The weirdest thing you did. Okay, the weirdest thing. If you could, if I could mute your mic again, that'd be great. There you go. I think there somewhere. Over here. Okay. Yeah, the weirdest thing I the weirdest thing happened to me in space. I was told this was going to happen, but when it happens to you, you kind of you just go, oh, uh, it's amazing. I was doing a spacewalk, and I was crawling out underneath the space station, and I was, if you can imagine, I was looking up at the space station as I was crawling this way, or hand over hand, and in an instant, just instantaneously, I was not looking up at my hands, I was looking down at my hands, because gravity was not telling me which way was down, my eyes were telling me, my mind was looking at what it was looking at, and it decided I was not upside down, it decided I was right side up, and so... My mental picture was, I mean, immediately turned the other way. And I went, <laughs> and I looked around, and I realized I was actually upside down. And so I, my mind took me back upside down. And I thought, that was cool. And then I went on around the side of the space station, and I had to do some uh, work on the other side of the space station where when I train in Houston, we train in a swing pool to do spacewalks. And so... Gravity in the swing pool is still working and it's still pulling you down, except the suit is floating. And they make, it, they make it buoyant by putting foam on the outside of the suit. But when you go upside down in the pool, all the blood get, rushes to your head. You fall in the suit. Your, your shoulders hurt. So being upside down in training is painful. Being upside down in space doesn't matter because you're not upside down. So I would go to my work site and I would poke my head down and I'd realize... Oh, it's right side up because you feel right side up. And so doing the work was the, it was the exact same as any place else. Here, 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 here is whatever you want it to be. And your mind can actually, you can do it on your own. That was absolutely the weirdest thing uh, that happened to me when I was on the space station was when that, that instant when it changed, I went, huh, and then, uh, then I started doing it on my own. It was a lot of fun. Good stuff. Good question. Let's go next to Kainai High School again for a question. Uh, who has a question at Kainai High School in Alberta? Okay, I got to speak up. I couldn't quite hear it. Yes, I did. Did you have to exercise in space? Yes, uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, long duration, if you're on space station for six months, you exercise, I think, two hours a day is what you're required to exercise. And that's both aerobic exercise where you're running on a treadmill uh, and you're actually bungee corded down to the treadmill because otherwise you'd, you'd float away. Um, so you actually, they pull you down and you run on a treadmill. Uh, we didn't do that. We had a little cycle, a little bicycle, a cycle ergometer. I, I love to ride bicycles. Um, that's I do it every day. And on the space station, actually, I rode a bicycle from Sydney, Australia, to Los Angeles, California, across the Pacific in about 20 minutes. That was fun. But you have to pedal because you have to keep your heart. You want your heart to keep working be, um, and beating well because in space, uh, all the blood is no longer being pulled down to your lower extremities. And so your heart does not have to work as hard to pump that blood back up to your head. So you're actually, since a heart's a muscle, it'll actually get weaker over time if it's not working as hard. Because when you're not going to stay in space your entire life. you got to come back to Earth. And if your heart's not pumping as hard, uh, you, lose muscle, you lose muscle mass on your body, and that includes your heart. So you exercise. You run on a treadmill. They actually do resistive exercise, where since you can't lift a 500-pound weight, because it's weightless, 
they actually have um, springs that you, you pull against, and the resistance of those springs or these mechanisms uh, actually give you resistive, resistive exercise, and you can actually still work your biceps, triceps, deltoids, your quads, whatever. And so you can maintain that muscle mass. Um, so when you come home, you haven't, you haven't lost any of it. And the space shuttle, we used a cycle ergometer. <coughs> and I think they have the same thing on space station as well, a big cycle. that's actually isolated. Um, as you run on a treadmill and you're bouncing, that bouncing will actually couple into the space station. And the space station will start to bounce. And so if you do it enough, you can actually drive the space station to where it will actually break apart. So what they do is they actually isolate that treadmill uh, so that when you run and bounce on a treadmill, the space station doesn't feel it. So they got some really smart engineers that figured out how to build these systems that you can use in space and not cause damage. You exercise every day. <clears throat> and when you spacewalk, that's this exercise in and of itself. Imagine squeezing a tennis ball for about eight hours with both hands and opening and closing your hands against a glove that's trying to stay closed. So your hands hurt, uh, you lose fingernails, um, you get beat up really bad, your hands, your forearms, uh, your shoulders, you get, you get a real workout uh, doing a spacewalk. Good question. Okay. Now I have a bit of a mouthful one for you this time, Commander Harrington. But uh, I don't know if you've heard this one before, so it might make you think. Okay. Uh, Wendy from Calgary wants to know, uh, at a recent event near Buffalo Mountain in Banff, several Aboriginal leaders talked about Aboriginal science or ways of knowing and Western mm -hmm. science. Do you see a conflict between traditional spiritual and intuitive learning about space and astronomy and the empirical or evidence-driven methods you used as an astronaut? And how do you put them together? Excellent question. I do not see a difference. I see... I look at it this way, and, and I'm working on my PhD right now in education, and my, my work uh, looks at the factors that motivate and engage Native American students in math and science, and looking at, at you know, indigenous ways of knowing, and there's a guy named Greg Cayete that wrote a really, has written numerous books on the idea of indigenous science and having this ability to use your um, a cultural understanding of the world around you. Um, one of the things is I look at Native people, Aboriginal people, uh, have been remarkable observers of the world they live in for, for centuries. You know, for millennia, they've looked at the world they live in, and they've been able to reconcile what they see and build things and do things in order to survive and to flourish without the use of Western science, Western mathematics, you know, Western, Western thought. You know, indigenous thought solves these same problems, maybe in a different manner, but in ways that help their, you know, their, their people survive. So I can use examples. Uh, there's a place in, uh, in New Mexico called Chaco Canyon. In Chaco Canyon, this remarkable uh, Pueblo, uh, Anastasi um, uh, buildings, civilization that existed about 500 to 1,000 um, years uh, in the common era. And what they built structures were multi-storied structures. They built structures that were very linear, very straight. They took advantage of incredible solar, uh, uh, solar passive solar. Uh, they built a calendar uh, called the Sun Dagger that accurately marked the passing uh, times and the seasons. And here is Aboriginal um, knowledge going into building structures and building uh, observation uh, calendars and things just on their ability to actually uh, observe the world around them. So if you think about a Western scientist, or you think about somebody that uses these skills, you can look at people that they ask a question, they, they theorize something and present a theory, they go through a method to see if that theory proves out true or not, and if it's false, then they toss that theory out and they go back and do something else. In Aboriginal people, or Native people, that is how they live. And so I look at people that have an indigenous way of knowing, indigenous knowledge, directly correlate that and can put that into an applicability when it comes to doing uh, engineering, uh, molecular biology, uh, astronomy, uh, geology. They have this, I think, an inherent way of looking at the world that other folks may not look at the same way. So yeah, I think there's a, a huge place for it. And I think um, believe in who you are, believe in where you come from, believe in your ability to solve problems because your ancestors did it millennia ago 
without using calculus, without using chemistry. You know, it was what was what was a part of who they were. They just didn't use those words for it. How's that answer that? I like yeah, that one. Thank you. It was a very thoughtful answer. Um, and I think, um, let me see what, what we have next here. Um, the students at Dr. G. M. Egbert School are wondering, how has your perspective of Earth changed since you went to the ISS? Um, I feel really, really tiny. My, uh, my perspective of my place uh, in the universe has sh shrunk down to this looking down at the earth and its incredible beauty and realizing that my, my family's down there, my, my parents, my kids, you know, you look down and you realize, but you can't see them. You know they're down there. You know all these things, you all these places you've been growing up, all the places you've hiked as a kid or backpacked or driven your car or your bicycle, you know they're there. All the people you interacted with, you know they're there, but you can't see them. And so to me, it made me appreciate really, um, I'm very insignificant in the great scheme of things. Um, but I played a part in it. I played a part in doing some remarkable things, which makes you appreciate what we're all capable of doing. Because we all we could all work together to do it. So it made me appreciate really, one, the beauty of the earth uh, and seeing these things from this really distant macro perspective. Uh, but also realizing that the really important things are the ones that you know are down there but you can't see. And so it, it made me appreciate that much more all the places I've been and all the people I've met and all the things that I've had a chance to do in this, when you see it from this really large scale. And if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon or been up in Banff or been up uh, in the Rockies and stand up on the tallest mountain or the edge of a, the rim of a canyon and look down, and it's one thing to see it from that perspective. It's another thing to be down in it. And, and both have this remarkable uh, perspectives. But we need to, I think, stepping back from it and looking down makes you appreciate being down there that much more. Hmm. Uh, OK, well, a little more of a technical question. We'll, we'll get away from the, the philosophical a little bit. Okay. Um, Ms. Bobian's grade five class at Grant McEwen in Calgary wants to know, how do they get and resupply the oxygen needed to survive in space? Excellent question. When the space shuttle was flying uh, to the uh, space station, we actually took oxygen from the space station. We actually hooked up lines that carried oxygen from our vehicle and replenished the oxygen on the space station. And the Russians do that uh, now with the Russian Soyuz uh, cap, not Soyuz, but the Progress, which is a unmanned or a, you know an uh, it isn't, it's a vehicle that does not take people up to the space station. It takes cargo and supplies and, and, and resupplies oxygen and nitrogen uh, to what the station needs. Um, there are other vehicles that fly to the space station that actually carry supplies, maybe not necessarily oxygen or hydrogen, uh, but other things are not hydrogen. Um, the, uh, the fuel that you use to actually control the space station um, is done with the vehicle that actually arrives and docks to the space station. Um, and also, it's controlled by large wheels that spin, and they use the momentum from these big spinning wheels to actually tweak and move the space station ever so much. So you don't need to resupply those at all. So vehicles take it up, and uh, that's how they use it. They don't make it on board. Except, I can remember this, the Russians have a system where you actually uh, make oxygen. Uh, there are canisters where... Uh, the exothermic reaction of these uh, of the chemicals in this these canisters gives off oxygen, and uh, they have that on the Russian side. We don't have that capability on the U.S. side. These are great questions. I like these. Testing my knowledge. Yeah, good stuff. Well, let's go back to our uh, direct participants again, and we'll start with Kainai High School this time. Go ahead, Kaina. How much money do you make as an astronaut? How much money do you make as an astronaut? Well, you know, that's, a, that's an excellent question because, you know, we get a job, we want to know how much we're going to get, and uh, nice to be able to buy things. I was a naval officer that was assigned to NASA. So I was paid the same that a naval officer who was on a ship or flying an airplane was paid. When I started, I was probably making about 
when I started as an astronaut, I was probably making about seventy thousand a year. By the time I left, I was probably making about one hundred and thirty, one hundred forty thousand a year, uh, which is great. I mean, it's a it's a fabulous amount of money to make. The neat part of that was I enjoyed going to work every day. I liked getting up in the morning and going to work because you get paid a lot of money, but if you hate what you're doing, there's something missing. And I looked forward to going to work every day because it was fun, it was challenging, it was tough, uh, difficult, very satisfying. But I also got paid to do it. I got paid to fly airplanes. You know, I got paid to sit in an airplane at 40,000 feet, um, scorching over to, to Florida or going to Washington State or things. Uh, and that was great fun, uh, but it was also challenging. I got paid good money to uh, to do some remarkable stuff. So I'd say about 140,000 a year was what I was making when I quit, retired. So that brings me to a question um, from Mr. McKinley's grade seven class at James Strath School in Peterborough, Ontario. They want to know why you decided to retire from NASA. Oh boy, so these are great. I flew in uh, November of 2002. I went to space station. About a month and a half later, uh, a space shuttle named the Columbia didn't come home and it killed seven people and three of those were my classmates. Uh, we didn't fly for about two and a half years because we needed to solve the problem that we knew happened on the Columbia to prevent it happening again on the next shuttle. So when the next shuttle flew about two and a half years later, uh, lo and behold, another chunk of foam came off of that space shuttle's tank and, and missed the space shuttle, but uh, the problem hadn't been solved. And so we didn't fly for another year and a half. I was training to go to space station as, as a commander to two Russians. And uh, I was um, diagnosed with osteoporosis, which is a uh, low bone mass in my lower back. And uh, NASA flight surgeons decided that I had a high risk of breaking my back on a Russian spacecraft. So I got disqualified by US flight doctors on a Russian spacecraft. And my Russian crewmate, Oleg, who's a flight, flight surgeon, said, John, you come back rubber chicken. We don't care. And, um, but because of that, I had a chance to fly the shuttle still. But I decided that uh, I was given an opportunity uh, to work in the commercial space field and be a test pilot and, and possibly fly a vehicle to space twice a week instead of once every two years. And, um, and I, I decided to retire uh, and to go off and pursue that. Unfortunately, that business didn't pan out. And I ended up uh, being retired, looking for a job in my late 40s. And I uh, decided that I enjoyed education so much and working in motivation that I went back to college. And I'm about a month from defending my dissertation in uh, education. And I'll uh, be a doctor of education here, hopefully, in December. And uh, work on the ideas, what are the factors that motivate and engage kids? Because I knew, I knew what worked for me. So um, that's kind of that story in a nutshell. What I'd like to do, while we still have a little bit of time, is I want to kind of expand on the very first question you asked me because there's a portion of that that I thought is very important, that I think is very important, that I want all the students out there uh, to hear. And it talks about that journey about becoming an astronaut. Um, when, I, when I graduated from high school back in 1976, I knew I had to go to college because my parents told me I had to go to college. What I was going to do in college, uh, I didn't really know. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, my mom actually dropped out of high school um, to raise a family when she was like 17. Uh, she had my brother when she was 17, had me when she was 20. Um, my mom went back to college in her 30s and became a registered nurse. My dad has a PhD in experience, but he's never been to college. I mean, he's a, mechan he's a mechanical wizard. He can fix just about anything. And so, but they knew if I want to improve my chances for success, I needed to go to college. So when I went into college, um, I thought, well, what did I like to do? And it's, we need to get paid doing what we like to do. And I wanted to work outside. I, I didn't want to be behind a desk. I thought maybe forest ranger would be a neat, neat thing. I never talked to a forest ranger. I didn't know what they did. I had this picture of what they did, worked outside. Uh, I didn't know what they got paid. Um, so I went into college with the idea of majoring in forestry. Um, I took the basics. Um, I realized that I was not very good at biology. Uh, because why? Because I didn't study. I learned to rock climb the very same year I entered college. And I spent all my time rock climbing and very little of my time studying. I passed some of my classes, but I earned, I earned two Ds in biology and a D in, in history because I didn't study. I was not motivated to study. I didn't like being in the classroom. And so the university uh, did me the favor, well, it wasn't a favor, but they kicked me out. I got kicked out of school my first year because I didn't have good grades. I had a 1.72 grade point average. And um, I took that year 
I call it my academic sabbatical. Um, I took the year that I was kicked out of school to take my rock climbing experience. Offer, I was offered a job as a surveyor in the mountains of Colorado, hanging off of cliffs um, with a little piece of glass about the size of this cup right here. And my job as a rock climber was to repel down off of these cliffs and hold this piece of glass up against the, uh, up against the uh, cliff. And by doing that, I'm going to draw this really quick. Because we're going to do some math really quick here. Here was, this, uh, here was this highway we were building right here. Okay, and I was a rock climber right here. My job was to hold a piece of glass because guys on the ground would shoot an infrared beam of light to this piece of glass I held. And now, light travels at a constant velocity. So if, it, if you know how long it took to go to here and back again, and that's what this box did, this computer determined how long it took the light to go from here to that piece of glass and back. And so if you know how long it took, you can determine the distance. So this is the distance right here. Well, this box also determined what this angle is right here. And this angle, if you know what this angle is, you know this distance, you can determine that, and you can determine that. And so what the surveyors wanted to do was know how far up this cliff was because they're building a highway. And they wanted to know if some of that rock actually stuck out to the side. So I was learning trigonometry. I was learning mathematics on the side of a cliff. And the guys that ran that instrument right there, uh, the guy that owned the company, convinced me if I wanted to make something myself, I better go back to college. Because this guy right here made $4 an hour uh, living in the mountains in, in, a, in a hotel. And he said, what are you going to do when you're 25? You know, what are you going to do when you're 30? You can't raise a family making, we call it minimum wage. And uh, he said, go back to school, become an engineer, and be this guy. Be the people down here. Uh, be the guy that owns this company. You know, be the engineer. And so his, his motivation, or my motivation was because I had a mentor that encouraged me to do something other than accept what, I, what the, the least thing I could do. And so I went back to school with the idea of being a, uh, um, an engineer. And I, I, got into my, uh, I got into my schoolwork. I paid attention. I studied. I had friends that studied. I had friends that liked what they were doing. So together, we pulled this off. And we worked together to solve problems so I'd learn the stuff. And by the time I was a senior, I tutored a guy in calculus who happened to fly airplanes in World War II. He convinced me to join the Navy. And so I realized that, yeah, I could fly airplanes and get paid for it and, and end up making good money flying airplanes, and then using my expertise, my technical ability, it eventually took me to NASA. So um, even though I did poorly in school early on, there was a reason, because I didn't, I didn't try. And when you don't try, you're not going to get very far. But when you do try, and you put the effort into it, and you listen to the people that are trying to make a difference in your life, to you, um, you'd be really surprised how far you can get. And I know if I hadn't listened to that guy, I'd, I'd be probably hanging off that cliff still or flipping burgers or something. So um, I listen to people that made a difference. And that's what you know, teachers do. That's what your parents do. That's what your boss does. You know, listen to them and, and make some really important decisions because you're the one that's going to uh, have to accept um, the results of those decisions. And I've been very fortunate in, in my career to have people that, that help me make those decisions. So anyway, I wanted to add that before we were, uh, before we were done. I think it's very important. Um, and that's why I'm going, getting a PhD, is because I want to work now with students and find out what motivates them uh, to stay in school, what motivates them to want to learn, and what it goes back to, and what my research has shown, and what the literature, as they say, uh, says, is that Aboriginal, uh, First Nations, um, Native people, a lot, you know, people in general, I think, like to work with their hands. Kids like to learn stuff that they can actually see, feel, touch, move around. And, and visualize what they're doing because that's because what you see in a book sometimes it's hard to absorb what's in that book and put it into practice and so if you see it in practice and you see people doing it um, then it makes it more uh, physical and you can actually get motivated to go down and learn that and that's what we need to find is those things that motivate us and I think it's hands-on experiential um, work that you can apply uh, the applicability of it so that's that's my two cents on that. I hope that helps. Thank you very much for that, Commander Harrington. I, 
I am looking at the clock here and I see that we are almost out of time. I think we have time for one more question. And I'd like to go to Rib Path Junior Public School to see if we've got one more question there in Ontario. How long were you up in space? How long, excuse me. How long was I up in space? I was in space for just shy of two weeks, about 14 days. We spent about seven days uh, docked to the space station. Uh, three of those days I did spacewalks. The other days we, uh, we transferred cargo. And when we undocked, we actually did more experiments. And then uh, we, when we were ready to come home, the weather was bad in Florida, and they wouldn't let us land. And so as I flew over Florida, you know, from a couple hundred miles above, I realized that the weather was bad all the way across the Gulf of Mexico, and I, I wouldn't be coming home for a while. So we spent about three, almost four days in space looking out the window and taking pictures and, and answering Internet questions and just enjoying the fact that I was in this really remarkable spot because I'd done my work and I'd done it well and I had a chance to um, appreciate being in a, uh, in a remarkable environment and, and being with some remarkable people that I enjoyed working with. So uh, two weeks went by like that, um, but I have a lot of memories and a lot of pictures and videos that uh, can uh, refresh that. And I was very fortunate. I only flew once. Uh, I'd love to have flown more than that, but you do what you do, and you, you go on. And I'm doing some neat stuff now, so I'm, I'm, that allowed me to, the opportunity to do this. Great question. Excellent. So, uh, Commander Harrington, you, you let us have a bit more insight into your pathway to becoming an astronaut. And I would never have guessed that you would have been able to continue that that path with what some people would think of as a, as a black mark on your resume if you've sort of done a, your school and taken some time off. I think we have this idea that all astronauts start as they're three years old with perfect academic records and uh, amazing things on the resume and nothing else. And so I think that's that's a really great thing for all of our viewers to know that uh, you essentially restarted with new motivation and, uh, and you followed your dream and you, you got there. Is there anything else that, that you would want to say to these students who might be thinking, maybe it's, I'd love to be an astronaut, maybe it's, I want a career in science, maybe it's something completely different. Do you have sure. uh, any, any parting words for us? Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, it's a great, great comment. Uh, I'll follow up on that is that we have this perception of what people do. And our perception is based on what we see. And most often it's what we see on TV or it's what we see in the movies or it's what you know, we imagine somebody doing and how we imagine how they got there. We never do it, you know, very often. How often do you talk to them? How often do you, do you talk to an astronaut? How often do you talk to an engineer? How often do we get a chance to talk to role models doing something that we think we might want to do? And I, I highly encourage anybody that if you have a career that you want to pursue, you darn well better talk to somebody doing that career and see what they like about it, what they don't like about it, because you may be surprised that you go down that path and you realize, I don't like this. This is not what I wanted to do. Well, make that decision early on by talking to all these different people. Um, in the astronaut office, there are people that were this tall, you know, that, that went on in everything in their career to become an astronaut. I think Chris Hadfield in Canada is one of those. Chris, from early, from early on, one of an astronaut, he did everything in his power to get there. He's a brilliant guy. You know, that is that is a portion of the office, but it's not everybody in the office. You know, a lot of folks head down this path and find out that, oh, I, I can do that. Um, but how did they get there? Because they worked hard, they worked well with others, they were good communicators, they had this ability to work with others. And, oh, by the way, they had a neat, they had a, a career that NASA could utilize in in their business. And so, you know, I was fortunate that. I, I went down that path, a little, maybe a little different than other people, um, but every, everybody has to realize they have that same opportunity uh, to go down to it, to an end goal, but they got to work that path to get there, and it's up to them to make the decisions to go down that path. So I say just believe in yourself and, and work hard and listen to the people that want to uh, help make a difference for you, and, and uh, you'd be surprised at what you're capable of doing uh, at the end of that. So that's, that's it. There you go. There's four more cents. <laughs> Excellent advice. Thank you. Sure. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I would like to say thank you again to the organizers at Beakerhead 
to the Alberta Women's Science Network's Power to Choose program and to the Cisco office and the staff in Calgary for making this event happen today. And most of all, thank you, Commander Harrington, for taking the time to share your experiences with us and, and your insight. And you truly are a wonderful role model for our youth. I'm sure you've heard that before, but, uh, but I mean it again now. And, um, and thank you to everybody who joined us today, um, including our, our two classes on the video conference. I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, have a wonderful day, and uh, we'll sign up. We'll see you next time for an, another PIR Live event. Thank you. Have a great time. Good job. Good job. Good job. Yay.